sharing tributes today in studio is Jess Milton, longtime friend and producer for nearly 14 years. And Jess, thank you for coming in. I mean, from the messages that we're getting, we know the country is feeling this tremendous sense of loss, but no one will be feeling it or few will be feeling it more acutely than you are personally as a friend and someone you work with so closely for these many years. So thank you for giving us some time. I was thinking, what a privilege these years must have been and how much you must have laughed yeah. <laughs> over these past 14 years. Really? Yeah, he, uh, he loved making people laugh. And more than that, he loved, um, he loved listening to people laugh. You know, he, one, of the, uh, one of the things about Stuart is people think of him as a performer, but he was a tremendously good listener. He did his research. He listened to people ahead of time, both in the, the essays that he wrote about all the different towns and cities mm -hmm. we visited, as well as, of course, the David Morley stories. Uh, he listened to the audience. He learned from the audience. Mm -hmm. They were like another editor for us. He rewrote his stories based on, uh, on what the audience taught us. And then, of course, he also uh, gave, gave the, the listeners an opportunity to become storytellers themselves with the Vinyl Cafe Story Exchange. He once told me that his favorite book, that his favorite of all of the Vinyl Cafe books, is one that he didn't write a word of, which is the Vinyl Cafe Story Exchange Stories. book. Yeah. <laughs> and he had a chance, as you said, to meet those people face to face when you would go out on the road. It just right. gave us some pictures of, of the two of them on the road. You did some hundred live performances right. every single year. So you must have some good road stories. What was it like <laughs> to be out on the road? Oh, it, was, it was fantastic. We had a lot of fun. Um, you know, our, our little, uh, we called it the Vinyl Cafe family, and it, it really did feel like that. I spent more nights a year uh, I spent more nights a year traveling with Stuart than I did at home with my husband. So it really was like a family, and we, you know, we traveled around on a tour bus, and we had some fantastic memories. I, I know one of Stuart's favorites was uh, uh, in Cape Breton in Glace Bay mm -hmm. at the Savoy Theater, a lovely old. It used to be a movie house that mm -hmm. they turned into a, uh, a, a theater, and he, uh, we were, we, as you probably know, Dave. The character Dave is from Cape Breton, and we were there performing a show about uh, a, a mining disaster. With this, the David Morley Spring story Hill. was about Spring mm -hmm. Hill, yeah. And uh, just before we went on stage, he looked at me and he, he didn't get nervous often, but he looked at me and he was kind of nervous and he said, what, we're here, here we are, we're telling these people their stories, is it gonna be okay? And I said, well, I think so, <laughs> I hope so. And he went out on stage and he started telling the story and this incredible moment happened about halfway, th near the end of the story, um, you know, the, the moments of silence are so, uh, were so special to Stuart, that moment when everybody was together experiencing the same thing. And uh, somebody kind of shouted out in the darkness. They said, Stuart! And he said, yeah. And he said, I was there. And it was uh, an 85-year-old man named Cubby Cuthbertson who had been, who worked in that mine. Really? And it was this moment that to me sort of epitomized what Stuart tried to do, which was blur blur the edges between the truth, and, or no, blur the edges between fact and fiction, but always speak the truth. And he, he did that and Cubby, uh, Cubby felt it. it. Yeah. But it also speaks to that Cubby would have felt that he could just say, Dave, you Absolutely. know, this connection, uh, you know, uh, Stuart, you know, I, I can tell you that I'm there. This connection that he had, which is just clear from the messages, did he understand that? And did he understand what it was, this magic? He was very modest. So he wouldn't, um, to answer your question, yes, he understood it and he cherished it. He loved that connection with the audience. That is, uh, he loved what he called the moment of giving and receiving. So most authors write something and they put it out there and they, you know, they're not there when at night when I'm laying in bed reading the novel. They don't, you know, they're not sitting there next to me. He got to be there and that was, his favorite part about performing is being able to be there for the moment when the audience received what he was saying. And uh, so, yes, I think he did understand it. Although he would, if he were here, he would laugh it off and say, oh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, he appreciated it and he mm -hmm. understood it but he, in a very modest way. I have to talk about favorite episodes. We're beginning from our viewers this morning, shared memories, favorite thoughts on episodes of the Vinyl Cafe, remembering, for example, when Dave met Morley, that's a favorite one, but of course the one that everybody comes back to is Dave Cooks the Turkey. So let's listen to a little bit. Did you take the turkey out of the freezer, she said. <laughs> Dave groaned. And he pulled himself out of bed and he went downstairs. He couldn't find a turkey in the freezer, <laughs> in either freezer. 
and he's about to call for help when the, the truth landed upon him like an anvil. Looking after the turkey, something he had promised to do, meant buying it as well as putting it in the oven. <laughs> So there, and of course it went on from there. I mean, you would probably be able to write every, recite every single word of that, Jess. But you had to bring that back every holiday, didn't you? It was we a did. Canadian tradition. Do you know that one year we didn't do it? Oh. So uh, early on in my tenure, maybe about 10 years ago, I said, this is, surely this is getting old. Like, people must be sick of the turkey. Right? And so, and Stuart felt, wondered the same thing too. And we, we learned so much from our audience over the years, and this is one of the, the times we learned from them because we didn't play it one year. Well, the le a few people wrote and said, oh, you know, great. There's all these other stories, play those. But thousands of people wrote, <laughs> thousands, Heather. And, and they said, no, what are you doing? This is our Christmas. It's not Christmas without Dave Cook's the, the turkey. turkey. Yeah. So it became part of That's right. the landscape, the cultural landscape, one of many great stories. And the characters, Dave in there, but of course Morley and Sam and Stephanie. I was wondering, he gave an interview to Chatelaine Magazine in 2013 and I was reading it this morning. He talked about you have to s start with the characters when you're writing. Start with the characters, spend time with your characters, visit the people you think you're going to write about and get to know them. So what was his relationship with his characters and how did he write them and evolve with them over the years? That's a fantastic question, and I'm really glad you asked because he got to know them so well. You know, by the end of, um, by the, end of the show, we would, in all seriousness, say ridiculous things like this. Well, pff, Morley would never do that. You know, we would say that as if it was a, <laughs> a, a, a friend or your, or your aunt or something. And the thing is, we knew that she, what she would and wouldn't do. We knew what Dave would and wouldn't do. Something felt like Dave to us. Or, it, you know, would Dave do this? Mm, I don't know. No, he would do this. Uh, we got to know them. They, they were like, they were friends of ours. They were just like friends you have a... You never really know exactly what they're going to get up to, but you have a, a sense of the type of thing that um, they might do, the type of reactions they might have. Were they based on real life occurrences or were they all products of his? And it sounds like you collaboratively <laughs> fertile mind. And Meg Masters. He worked with um, his editor, long suffering Meg Masters. He worked with her for 25 years. So she had her hands deep in the clay of all of his stories. He, uh, when he first started out, some of them, like all authors, um, when he was just first starting, there were some autobiographical stuff, but that well ran pretty dry pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most of the time they weren't, you know, as I said, he, we got to know these characters so well that we, we started coming up with ideas based on their, on who they are, as, uh, who they were as people, right? We started having a sense of, you know, okay, well, last year Stephanie went tree planting. Is she going to go back tree planting this year? Or what is she, is she going to go work as an au pair? Or is she going to, what's going on with Tommy, her boyfriend? We would have discussions like this where we would, uh, he and Meg or he, Meg, and I would sit down and be like, what do you think Tom, what, what do you think Tommy's up to these days? Like, what's going on with him? You know, and we talked about them like they were, and they were friends. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And they were friends to those who listened yeah. to the stories as well. You know, I was thinking that, the thing that I talk about every day, you know, the worst of the world events, yeah. really, uh, on a daily basis, and the sad events in the world, troubled times in the world. And there was Stuart McLean, always humanity, always goodness, yeah. always kindness. How was he able to keep that intact over these many years? He, he was an incredibly optimistic person. And as, as clever as he was, and as much time as he spent uh, in his head, because of course he created an entire world, a community, a neighborhood, of, and families in his head, he wasn't guided by his head. He was guided by his heart, or as Stuart liked to say, his tummy. Uh, he would often say, well, what does your tummy say? Or my tummy is telling me this. He was, um, he was guided by instinct. And what his tummy told him is that the world is a good place, that it's full of good people, and that you just have to give them an opportunity to be their best selves. And if you do that, they will. His tummy also told him that life is made up in moments. Uh, you never know which one is going to count and which one is going to be forgotten. So you have to make the most of every moment that you have. Well, I love that thought, and it's actually on the Vinyl Cafe Facebook page yeah. that you have posted. And it was going to be my very question to you. If life is moments mm -hmm. and the ones that you're not going to forget, right. what's, what's the moment of you and Stuart McLean that you are absolutely mm -hmm. not going to let go of? Mm. Um, I think the moment that I won't forget is the moment um, just uh, when, so I sat stage left at every single show. And I, you know, we did 75, 100 shows a year and all across the country. And I always sat stage left. 
and he did this, uh, he had this incredible connection to the audience, but he, I, he, I was also lucky enough to have that connection with him, and that moment just before he delivered a line, and we were sort of curious about how it would go. He would do this amazing thing, um, it's nice to be on TV instead of radio so I can actually do it Just myself. He, he, he would kind of lean back like that and then look at me and raise his eyebrows and then lean right into the microphone and deliver it. And that moment of anticipation, um, sort of like that swirl of a wine glass before you take the sip, he loved that and I loved watching him do it. I've loved hearing your stories. Thanks, Heather. <laughs>